Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the briefing on the Voting in Prison Bill SBA, SBA 28. My name is Tina Brady Pettis. I am the League of Women Voters of Chicago Board of Member of Issues and Advocacy. Here with me, joining me today is Alexandria from Chicago Votes. The reason why I feel that the SBA 2A is very important, it gives a very important impact on people who are in prison to give them their rights to vote. There are not just people, there are human beings who have made mistakes, are willing to do something right by their lives and want to make a difference as well. I'm going to have Alexandra talk about a little bit about the SBA 2A and I'll get into the more details about the reason why I joined this per se about the SBA 2A bill. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here this morning with you all for this briefing on SB 828 and restoring the right to vote for our community members that are serving sentences in our Illinois prisons. <clears throat> so again, my name is Alex. I am a community organizing manager at Chicago Votes. Um, Chicago Votes is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that works to dismantle the barriers that exist for people to engage in civic engagement. Um, we focus on young people ages 18 to 35, although now um, we started working with middle schoolers um, who are interested in learning about the legislative process. And we've also started working with older populations that are currently incarcerated in our Illinois prisons. Um, <clears throat> so Senate Bill 828, I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. Um, Chicago Votes, we started working in the intersection of the American legal system and correctional institutions when we really realized how many young people are incarcerated. And so their right to vote is being suppressed it's not accessible. Um, and so League of Women Voters has been an amazing partner with Chicago Votes for so long now, starting in the Cook County Jail um, and really getting in there and making sure that folks that already have a right to vote that are in pretrial detention in jails, that we set up a system for them to vote um, and we pass a law to make that happen. And so now looking, Chicago Votes has now moved on after passing that law and, and working on implementation to really see that half of the Illinois Department of Corrections population is also young people, 18 to 35, who do not have a right to vote and whose um, civic engagement is thus being very suppressed. And so Senate Bill 828 would, would be the first law of its kind in the country to restore the right to vote for people that are currently serving a conviction. Um, currently, I will go into a little bit more feedback, but I just want to give everybody an update about the Senate bill. And then I think also Tina is going to talk about her involvement with the Senate bill and veto session, right? Veto session is usually runs in October, November. It's very, very short session. Um, and it's a type of session that allows lawmakers to overturn any vetoes that the governor might have done during regular session, January to May. Um, it also allows lawmakers to continue working on bills that may not have got, gotten across that finish line. So our Senate Bill 828 that restores this right to vote, um, we kept working on it in veto session um, and we were able to bring it to a vote on the House floor. It received 57 votes out of 60. Um, we were able to postpone it. So this is something, I'm not sure if everyone knows, this is something you can do through our legislative process. But when you bring something to a House vote on the floor, um, and it doesn't get the 60 votes it needs to to pass, you can do something called postpone it, which I learned literally as it was happening. And that means you get a second chance on this bill. So it doesn't die. Um, so it's gonna go to January and we get a second chance at 60, which is really exciting. So I'm going to back up a little bit and I'm gonna share my screen. Um, 
because I'm just going to go through more of the background about why I believe you should care about this um, and why it's so, so important. So th these slides come from Dr. Christina Rivers. Dr. Christina Rivers is a PhD of political science. She teaches at DePaul University. Um, she is the, she was my professor when I first started going inside Stateville prison. Um, and she is the one that brought this term felony disenfranchisement laws to me for the first time. And I was able to have discussions with folks that are currently incarcerated in Stateville prison um, about their lack of voting rights and what we can do together to change this. So um, <clears throat> this equation that she has put together is that mass incarceration in the United States and mass convictions plus felony disenfranchisement laws make a very constrained democracy, right? The very large amount of people that we are incarcerating plus these laws that take away the right to vote for people incarcerated equals a constrained democracy. So the number of those who can vote, which impede, is being reduced through these laws, which impedes the representation of these individuals and their communities, right? 60% of people that are incarcerated throughout the state of Illinois come from Cook County and Chicago. So if we have felony disenfranchisement laws of people that are incarcerated in Illinois, it is impacting Chicago and Cook County and the representation. It also creates racial disparities in voting and representation, right? Um, so I'm going to go to this next slide, which shows the rate of incarceration in the United States. This comes from the Sentencing Project. So felony disenfranchisement laws were not addressed by the Civil Rights Movement, nor the Voting Rights Act that came out of the Civil Rights Movement. And that is for a couple reasons. Um, the first reason is that if you look at, you know, the 1950s to the late 1960s, um, you can see that incarceration rates were far lower than what they are now. So during the Civil Rights Movement, this wasn't as potentially as glaring of an issue as it is now. Also during the civil rights movement, um, there was a level of respectability politics going on of that if we include folks that are incarcerated, that might damper our message. Um, and so this, those are a couple of reasons why it was not addressed in the civil rights movement. But as we can see in 1980s with, Nixon and the war on crime going into Reagan and the war on drugs, we can see a very sharp increase in our, our incarceration rates. So right now, this is this just goes to 2019, um, but we can see how many people are being disenfranchised through incarceration. And so we talk about who are those people. Um, this is from the Prison Policy Initiative, and it shows the racial disparities of who is in our prisons, right? So you can see how specifically this very long bar of Black people that are being incarcerated, as well as these other um, different groups. And so this is something we have to keep in mind if we're saying that we're taking the right to vote away from people in prison. We have to know who are we talking about, which um, racial groups are we talking about specifically? Um, so right, this past graph matched with this can show that we are, this law is disproportionately impacting black people in the state of Illinois. So more along the US population and how we are currently impacted by felony disenfranchisement, right, we should know that 25% of the world's prison population is in the U.S. That is all us here. Um, 
And so we are the only developed democracy with such high incarceration rates and so many felony disenfranchisement laws. So both of those together. Currently 48 states disenfranchise those that are serving a sentence for a felony, felony conviction. So currently Maine and Vermont, they have always allowed people who are incarcerated in their states to vote. They vote by mail in their states. This has never been something that they've questioned. Um, and so we can see two states that have been successful with allowing their folks in prison to vote and be a part of their democracy. Um, and so we want to follow that model. Currently, um, currently, Oregon is also trying to be the first state to restore the right to vote for people in prison. So we are currently fighting this race with Oregon to see who can do it first um, and claim that title. And so we should be, we should do it first so we can claim that title. Um, and so again, why does this all matter? So U.S. disenfranchises significant numbers of people and the racial disproportionalities in arrests and conviction both reinforce reinforces and are reinforced by the racial disproportionality in voter eligibility and representation. So um, overall, as of 2017, 7.4% of adults, African Americans were disenfranchised compared to their representation in the US population, which was only 1.8%. Two, 2 million or 36% of those disenfranchised due to felony convictions were black, African Americans are roughly 13% of the U US population. Um, and so other big numbers that I wanted to make sure that I pointed out to y'all is that crime rates are not disproportionate by race. So we, there have been many studies that have come out, research to see do black people, white people, Latino people, or is someone actually um, committing crimes at a specific rate? And, and we have seen that it is not. What is disproportionate is the arrests, the convictions, the incarceration rates, those are disproportionate by race. Um, and so these disparities in the criminal legal system and these felony disenfranchisement laws, again, create disparities in our voter access and our democracy as a whole. Um, and so through felony disenfranchisement, we are suppressing these votes of mostly black people in our state. Um, and again, this is so important because as we all know, and as we all fight for, and we say almost every day, voting is so important. It matters. We all care about voting so much. Um, and we know that when someone votes and when someone is civically engaged, it creates a sense of community, belonging, um, and it actually shows that we will be decreasing recidivism when a formerly incarcerated person feels a sense of community, full citizenship, and political belonging. Um, and people in prison do want to vote. They want to be a part of this process with us. Um, this was demonstrated literally by our work with the League of Women Voters inside Cook County Jail since 2016. I mean, us going inside of the jail with folks that are incarcerated um, and have a right to vote, many of which are told they do not. In the election, I think it was the 2020 election, the Cook County Jail, when it was a polling location, had a higher turnout rate than Chicago. So folks were showing up and extremely engaged and they want to be, right? And so in Stateville Prison, um, we did a survey to ask people about their interest in civic engagement. 64% of them had voted prior to incarceration. That's a lot of people. 98% said they would vote while incarcerated if that was an option. 92% said they would vote when released. 95% responded that voting is very important to them. 90% would take a voter education course while incarcerated. And that is a law now. There are voter education courses for everyone leaving prisons in Illinois. And 93% were very or somewhat 
closely followed the 2016 presidential campaign showing that there is interest and a lot of people did use the resources they had to follow what was going on in our campaigns and elections. However, only these much lower numbers is that folks didn't know their voting rights and they didn't know the process to regain their voting rights after release. And so voter education continues to be an extremely important um, aspect of our work. This is another survey that was much larger and it was done in California. So um, if you need even more percentages that were very close to the one done in Stateville, basically these different statistics are saying that people have voted prior to incarceration. Um, they would vote while incarceration if that was an option. Many say they wanna have elected leadership. Um, in Illinois, people who have a felony conviction can't run for local offices. And that is a law on our books that we should talk about. Um, many say that voting would make them feel more connected to their communities. Again, this survey was also done by the Marshall Project in 2020. And so many uh, surveys have been done about this, basically all to say that people care and they wanna be involved. And we should take those steps in 2021 and almost 2022 to expand our democracy um, and include more people to make it better, right? Because democracy always will work better when we have more people involved. So thank you so much. And I will pass it back to Tina. Wow, thank you so much for that information. That was a lot of information. I hope everyone get a better understanding of what's going on, what is the process, the reason why this is so important. And the reason why I decided to get involved was because I think it was around my, maybe like, was it's been like two months ago, I think I went into the prisons and I was registering people. Uh, res I don't like calling people inmates, incarcerated. It's like, it's, it's still like a degrading name. So I would like to call them human beings because we all are human beings. And uh, when I entered the uh, facility, I noticed that I think I told um, Alex, I was like, there was this one person, he was actually making sure the other people was making sure they was filling out the, um, the registration form. That show you how important he felt that the need of this was a need to be done and very important for him and not only his his fellow people that were there with him to make sure that they had the right to vote. And not only that, um, also we need to understand that everything we do in life is about, is about a voice. Someone has to speak up, the person has to advocate, somebody has to follow through. So once we understand that, that means it would be more important for them to say that they are a human being and their voices matter. Because a lot of times people that are in prison they're being profited, money is being profited for them. So why can't they have a voice as well to see what's going on? You know, it was one ex, it was one lady, um, I heard her talk about, she was in prison and her child was taken away from her. So guess what? She didn't know what was going on with her child because she didn't have a right to vote. She didn't have a right to say anything that was going on with her child. So therefore I think things are like that, that needs to be a way that people in prison have a right to say what's going on even though they're not there at that particular time, they still should have their voices need to be heard. So any questions for um, Alexandra and myself? Um, how about I put us back on, um, put us back on gallery so we can sort of, I'm gonna remove spotlight. I think um, if you want gallery mode, I think everyone needs to do it for themselves. You're probably still in speaker mode. Um, okay. But yes, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit um, about who's sponsoring the bill, where the hangups are, uh, what, what, just a little bit more uh, about the nuts and bolts. Uh, so um, I would, I'll go on and tell you who's sponsoring the bill and Alice, Alice could tell you about the, the, the second part. So um, Senator Mike Simmons, Representative LaShawn Ford, Representative Joyce Mason, uh, Amaya Gande, Director of Voting Rights at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, Avalyn Betts Gaston, Director of the Illinois Alliance for Reentry and Justice. Fantastic. Yeah. Yep, so 
Representative Ford, he has been, he is on, on the west side of Chicago, the Austin neighborhood. Um, he has been running this voting in prison bill for at least five years now, but it's more like he sponsored the bill, but there hasn't really been a big movement behind it. Um, I think until Chicago votes, we really took it on as our platform and what we're fighting for. Um, and so we've really seen it get pushed further than I think we've ever seen it and the momentum behind it. Um, I think it's been more real than it ever has been in the past five years. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement around it, a lot of community organizations and faith uh, institutions that are very interested in this work um, and have gotten behind this campaign. Um, so Senator Simmons and Senator Robert Peters are two senators that have been really pushing it and behind it. Um, this bill has seen some opposition for, I think the three main areas and the opposition, it's more of just concern about how will it be implemented has been a question. Um, specifically the State Board of Elections has really been the only main very vocal opposition and their opposition has been around is this bill constitutional um wasn't this bill passed by the senate it was not passed by the senate um it hasn't gotten to the senate yet so it's a senate bill 828 and it's in the house and that's only because at the end of the last session we had a house bill right and that was our vehicle, but the house bill hadn't moved. And so they said, you need a bill that's made it through the Senate, that's in the house, that's dead, that we can gut and replace it with, new, with this language. So that way it can just go back to the Senate for concurrence. So another very interesting <laughs> loophole of our legislative process, um, but it would still need to go back to the Senate um, because they haven't seen this new language that we've put in there about voting in prison. Um, is, is acceptance of this bill an upstate downstate divide? Definitely not. Um, we actually have a lot of downstate support um especially in metro in sorry east st louis we have a lot of support specifically um and so definitely not a downstate upstate divide um so state board of elections they came out in opposition because they said the bill is not constitutional um, we believe, we are fighting to say that this bill is constitutional. And what I'll do to answer that quick question is I'm just going to share my screen one more time, just because I just want to bring y'all directly to what you should be looking at um, and how we made this decision. So this decision came from the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, specifically Ami Gandhi, the director of voting rights. So if we go to the Illinois Constitution itself, and we go to article three, which is suffrage and elections. And we go down to voter voting disqualifications, which is section two. It says that a person convicted of a felony or otherwise under sentence in a correctional institution or jail shall lose the right to vote. Okay, so we know they have to lose the right to vote once convicted which right shall be restored not later than upon completion of a sentence. So this is the very specific part that we are using to make our argument that we believe this is constitutional. This right shall be restored. So shall means it has to be restored, not later than, so specifically not later than upon completion, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, and to, I think, hopefully many others, not later than would mean that it can be restored before sure. completion of the sentence. And so that is what we have been using to make this argument. Something else that I will point out is that when that, that constitution, that constitutional language was passed in 1970, uh, when this constitution was written, this, this version. 
since it's vague, and I think many of our lawmakers knew it was vague, and they knew that this opens us up for potentially restoring someone's right to vote beforehand, um, they created election code. So election code, which can be changed simply through a bill, like SB 828, in the election code, as you can see, I've gone here many times. <laughs> um, let me see. Qualifications. It is in here somewhere. Let me see. So this here says no person who has been legally convicted, serving a sentence, shall vote, offer to vote, attempt to vote until his release from confinement. So this is the language that currently doesn't allow someone to vote while they're in prison until they're released. So SB 828 crosses this out. We delete this language. We are saying, nope, we don't want this. This is disenfranchising. This is suppressing votes. So we can delete this language out of the election code, thus making opening the constitution back up for our original interpretation. And we're taking it a step further and adding affirmative language to affirm the constitution to say that someone's right to vote will be taken away and then restored 14 days after um, they've been convicted. Yeah, Catherine. Yeah, uh, so, <clears throat> I'm gonna get into the weeds for a moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if, uh, I don't even know how to put this, but um, with the big huge omnibus uh, criminal justice bill that was passed um, this last year, mm -hmm. um, I was uh, pleased, surprised, but pleased to see that prison gerrymandering has mm -hmm. been struck out of this mm -hmm. so that from and I don't know from what, what point on this starts, but basically um, the fact that Danville isn't going to be able to count all of the inmates who receive nothing from mm -hmm. that area as uh, people who will bring more, you know, more into that. In other words, um, and that they're at some point, and I don't know when it will be implemented. That's, my, that's where I'm gonna get confused. Um, every single person who is in uh, a state prison will be of the community, counted in the community, right? Yes. Okay, so there's that. So I'm just wondering two things. I'm wondering, when does that start? Because if it doesn't start immediately, I can see a lot of uh, reps and senators who are from these districts uh, definitely not wanting the people in the state prison uh, voting. Uh, and I'm wondering two things, uh, is, that, is that the case? And, and is this getting a second life because these people know uh, that they won't be skewing the vote now that prison gerrymandering has been changed? And am I right in saying that they will be voting at their original address? Yeah, so... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> gerrymandering is supposed to be going into effect um, for the 2030 census. So it, it doesn't actually go into effect until 2025 um, for the 2030 census. Um, and in this bill, in this language, people will be voting at their last known address. So they oh, will oh. not be voting it, at the prison where they're at because again just like the reason we were fighting for prison-based gerrymandering is we're fighting for the political power in yeah. the neighborhoods where folks have been taken away from which is 60 percent again it's mostly Chicago and Cook County um, but yes in here this is the if you've never seen language of a bill this is what it looks like it's not it's it's not as crazy as it might look basically if it's underlined it means we're adding new language and if it's if you see anything crossed out that's what we deleted um it's pretty easy to write this language if you haven't you know it's not too crazy of a thing to do um but this is where i think we had um 
we put in like the term of like resides so like the last place where they resided mm -hmm. is where they should be able to vote um and are you pushing that when you try and get votes because i i, I think that would be very important for some of the downstate um, yeah mm -hmm. that's so. Yeah, but we've been trying to make that message very clear is that someone would be registering to vote in their last known address. Uh huh. Sharon has her hand up. Sharon has a question. Um, uh, uh, actually, I, I have a comment. Um, the Freedom to Vote Act, which is currently gridlocked in Congress and may not, in fact, pass very important bill, um, including protection of election workers and a number of other things aside from countering suppression of the vote. There is a provision in that Freedom to Vote Act that says, which applies to federal elections because under the constitution, the US government can regulate federal elections. Um, there is a provision, as I said, regarding federal elections, then anyone convicted of a crime currently incarcerated for conviction of that crime cannot vote. Mm. Um, and uh, as I say, the Freedom to Vote Act may not pass, but this bill could become law in Illinois but if the Freedom to Vote Act passes, um, that um, state new state law under SB 828 could not apply to federal elections. Federal elections next year would include electing members of the US House, electing the US Senate. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this is not very well publicized. Mm -hmm. But I know this because some of you know my, my role in the state league, I'm election law issue specialist mm. for the state league. And going through the weeds when the Freedom to Vote Act was proposed, um, interestingly enough, um, on the same day we were gonna have a webinar that had to be canceled um, regarding the freedom to the, the freedom of the people vote. I, I forget what the pr previous version was. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember, I don't remember the date, but it was a Tuesday <laughs> um, uh, in that. And so I don't know uh, to what extent LaShawn Ford is aware of this, uh, but um, everybody should be aware of this. Now, as I say, Freedom to Vote Act may not pass. It would be horrific if it didn't for all sorts of reasons regarding next year's election, but uh, this is an important point. My second point is, um, and I don't know this, maybe somebody knows this, has the State Board of Elections threatened a lawsuit they no. have not. Okay, so those are their, so they are they are objecting on constitutional grounds, pending passage re, re, regarding that. Um, and um, um, what have, if anything, um, the clerks' association? What's the clerks' association position on this bill? Do you know? We met with Don Gray from the Illinois Clerks Association, their stance is they will implement the bill when passed. Okay, and implement it, um, would it go into effect for the 2022 election or not until- No, at this point it would go into effect for the 2023 municipal elections. That would okay. be the first, it would go into effect, there's a task force to figure out implementation of the law um, so we are giving the State Board of Elections, local election authorities, and the Department of Corrections plenty of time to get ready for the 2023 municipals. Okay, so um, as I recall, not very many municipal governments have um, so-called primaries in February of 2023. 
it's mostly April of 2023. So is the target date really April of 2023? It's, it's going to be February because that's the first because election because there are elections in February. So we yes, want them okay. to be ready, but they should be able to implement April as well. And then I wanted to address the point about um, so in the US for election law, the, the federal does defer to state election law. And so in terms of federal elections, I do believe that our state people in state prisons will be able to have a right to vote because that would be our state law for federal prisoners. I think that's a different story. I think they would be disenfranchised right. through that law. Um, but I think this is what has been coming from Ami Gandhi at the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Okay, thank you. That's kind of frightening because that goes both ways. Does that mean that these states will continue? If they the pass voter suppression laws, yes, that is what the federal will defer to. And that's why it's just so terrifying that they're doing yeah. that. Huh. Interesting. I didn't. I didn't realize. That. I don't know why. I I, I'm. I'm really not sure about that. Um, regarding um, provisions in the Freedom to Vote Act, um, regarding um, which takes precedence in federal elections. I would um, need some written. Uh, not that I don't trust what you're saying. It's just um, for your own information. My background was. Um, before I retired, I taught political science um, and, um, and including an elections course. And obviously it's different now, but um, um, I, uh, for federal elections, um, I don't think that it defers to state law. Yeah, I'm happy to send an email connecting us with- And I know of me, I haven't talked with oh. her about that. She and I are on some committees and, and uh, coalitions and stuff. And I've known her probably 10 years now. It's, that seems hard to believe. <laughs> so, um, so implementation, as we know, with um, automatic voter registration uh, can be an outrageous uh, delaying, uh, delaying process. But it seems to me, um, and this is just a question, I guess, um, Implementation, yeah, we want it right. We want it to be uh, a voting site, the way Cook County Jail is. But uh, does one have to wait for implementation if one can just uh, if 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 the can the can the right be restored upon passage of the bill and therefore people can start asking for mail-in ballots? No. Well, if the law is passed, technically it goes into effect, it's going to be um, June 1st. And so, and the law restores the right to vote 14 days post conviction. And so I think technically, yes, I think someone could ask for, well, no, in the language, we specifically said that someone does not have the right, that the first election they'll be able to vote in is 2023 municipal. So we, we said that very specifically in the law because we knew that election authorities in the Department of Corrections would be um, very opposed to, if it would make them feel much it's more, more comfortable. work. Actually. Yeah, it would make them feel much more comfortable knowing that the law stipulates that they have till 2023. My, my question is, do they have to re-register? Yes, um, yes, because every single person is taken off the vote. Off the rolls, okay. That's so the, the first thing. The first thing they have to do is re-register. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's In interesting. The, uh, the voter registration form also serves as a application for an absentee ballot as well. And would they have, um, what address is that clear? That Let's would say be, the bill passes and the person want, is incarcerated and wants to re-register. What address is used on the re-registration? Re it will be their last known. Okay, right. not the jail. Not, but, not the, but the person. But the mail address would be different from the and that's registration different. Yeah. address. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And that's so in the law, there is a task force 
specifically that's supposed to come together with the local election authorities, Department of Corrections and the State Board of Elections because those right should be the experts on mm -hmm. election facilitation and movement within the prison. So they are the ones that need to come together and figure out what is necessary for each step. Okay, one other point, you said that on the voter registration, there's a line to ask if you want a, a vote by mail ballot. I thought that was only in effect for the 2020 election. Is that now back on that form? So we, it's not necessarily on the form, but in the language, it says that when someone turns in a voter registration form, that will also act as an application for an absentee ballot. Um, and so again, in terms of the logistics of what does that actually look like? That yeah. is not my job. That is the job of the local election authorities. Department. Right, okay. But, but the point is that that would have, to, the person re-registering would have to do something else to make sure they got a vote by mail ballot. What about this permanent vote by mail? Uh, That's identity? supposed to be established, but uh, it's supposed to be established for the 2022 election, but the specifics on that haven't been put on the Chicago board's website yet. That might be useful because it's- Yeah, that would help, but- Sharon, this guy. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I, I have a, a, another comment. Um, not well known is that the spring legislative session because of the June 28th primary is very short. It's from January 4th when they start and they adjourn, they don't recess. They adjourn on April 5th. It's, a, it's, it's not through the end of May next year. And uh, based on that information, um, is LaShawn Ford uh, planning to um, try to have a vote um, in, in February? Um, because it's, um, it, this is a new ball game to have uh, for every legislator in, in the Illinois General Assembly to have such a short um, session. And, um, one can intellectually realize it, but not necessarily politically and emotionally regarding legislation that they want. So um, is LaShawn Ford and his uh, co-sponsors trying to do this early on? Yeah, yes. So that's the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is that at the end of veto session, when the vote came down to 57 votes and Representative Ford postponed the vote, the question then was, are we going to try to bring this up for the second vote in veto session like today, or are we gonna wait till January? And he told us, I'm gonna bring it up in January. And Senator Mike Simmons, who is our Senate sponsor, we've been communicating with him. They are 10 toes down, ready to do whatever we need to do. Um, so they've they've shown us, but we can't even really think about the Senate because we need to get this thing through the House. I think if we get this thing through the House, that alone will be a major victory and we should count our success, uh, but we won't stop there. We will definitely push it through the Senate as well. Okay, the, there is a big difference, as you know. In the veto session, you needed a three-fifths majority. Starting in January, you need a simple majority. We sure do. Yeah, we need a simple majority. And it's a simple majority of the membership. So yeah. not voting is like a no vote. Yeah, we, yeah, yes. But yes. but it, even not voting being a no vote, uh, it's a big difference from between a simple majority and a three-fifths majority. Yeah, though that's, that's what we faced in veto session is that there were so many folks that just, they, they didn't even click not voting they just didn't even click a button. And so oh. two of our Black Caucus members weren't even there to cast their vote. Um, and so definitely trying to work with Representative Ford to make sure he also helps us confirm the 60 votes because many of them, many lawmakers wanna hear from Representative Ford specifically, not just the advocates. Thanks. Thank you. There's a oh, question. Say hello to Stevie for me. Will do, Sharon. So um, 
what was the question? Oh, Catherine um, asks, is anyone in the greater Chicago area that still needs convincing? I would say absolutely. Um, and I, I was, and I meant, uh, I meant representatives. Sorry, I was representative. Oh, representatives. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just starting with that. <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's not necessarily true because I've been speaking to a certain senator and trying to see how can we get her on board. Oh, absolutely. No, I was just so, trying to come up how, you know, I'm just moving to what, what are we going to do? And my, my question is, how are we going to get to 60? So I was just yeah. for a moment wanting to mm. talk about how do we get the, how do we get to 60? Yes, I yes. am going Go ahead. to open up um, a table that, and so I will say that on Tuesday, next Tuesday, December 7th, uh, Chicago votes will be having our voting in prison coalition strategy meeting. So if you are available and would like to join um, to talk more about the nitty gritty, getting to 16, what we're doing in January, um, that's December 7th at 415. So I think Tina should have that agenda or not the agenda, sorry, the Zoom link um, to potentially share with anyone that's interested. But I will quickly just share my screen to show this um, table. Okay. So specifically, these are people that didn't vote, that we had, we had done a roll call beforehand where we were down there trying to talk to literally every single representative we possibly could to get our yes roll call. Um, so these were folks that had told us or someone, a different legislator that they would vote yes on this, but they didn't vote. Um, whether they weren't there or for another reason, specifically Representative Costa Howard told us that she saw that this bill wasn't getting to 60. So she took, she was a yes vote and she moved it to not voting. Um, and so these are folks that we definitely could use help with to confirm their yes votes. Representative Manley told us that she wants to meet with us in January. Um, and I think Representative Yang Roar, she had just passed a bill, so she was off the floor. The question is, you know, I think why didn't she have someone click her button for her? Um, other folks, these are folks that voted yes, that we didn't expect them to vote yes, but they came out in support. D'Amico is leaving in June. He is going to be leaving and they already gave, they already assigned his replacement, which is someone is representative Mike Kelly now. Um, but I think in terms of your question, Catherine, representative Kelly Burke, um, she is someone that really we need support from and representative, um, I think Fran Hurley are two folks that we could really use support from. Mm -hmm. um, is Kelly Burke, are you, I'm trying to think, is that the uh, mayor of, Ever, of Evergreen? Is that Kelly Burke you're referring to? I, is it, I don't know if it's Evergreen Park, but I know she's the mayor down there. She's, yes. she's the representative. I know you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, uh, I have another question. It just occurred to me. Uh, has Governor Pritzker taken a position on this bill? So we've met with the governor's office several times, at least a couple of times now. Um, they have not taken a public stance either way on this bill. Um, they, however, what's interesting is that Emily Miller, who she, I think is, she is high up in the governor's office. I forget her actual position title now. Um, she is one of the people that get to help decide what is the governor's office actually gonna be supporting and behind. Um, and she is very in supportive of this bill and of um, Chicago votes, which is really wonderful. Um, but they haven't come out specifically in support or in opposition. I think they wanna see, does this bill have the votes? first. Mm -hmm. um, so Kelly Burke, 
again, so we met with Senator Bill Cunningham. He told us that he is in opposition to the to this bill in principle. So he just believes that taking away someone's right to vote is part of punishing somebody. Um, and so that's gonna have to be, do, do you use your time on someone like him to continue to talk about why we believe in it? Um, but I just wanted to give that update. So these are two folks, Ann Hurley, or sorry, Fran Hurley and Kelly Burke. Um, if there's any support that can be given to get these folks on board, that would be absolutely amazing. We don't necessarily see them getting on board, but if somehow we can, I think that is a huge success. Yes. Uh, question. Um, so I don't even wanna open up this can of worms, but I'm curious. <laughs> so I'm gonna open it anyway. Um, you know, uh, various uh, felony disenfranchisement laws across this country for people who have left prison, obviously, um, have gradations. So if somebody was convicted of X crime, uh, they don't, their vote isn't restored when they leave, but anyone who's convicted of these crimes, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I can't even imagine how it would be implemented, but has anybody, uh, I mean, when push comes to shove, if you get too many people, like what, what's his name, uh, who says it should be part of punishment, you know, I can't even imagine why being uh, in prison for um, selling a, a certain amount of something is any more of a reason uh, to, to be disenfranchised. Yeah, I, I, let me just leave it at that and just see what your response is. Well, uh, or you want to go, Alice, or you? Okay. So this is just my uh, personal um, opinion about what you just stated. Oh, just, just so you know, Tina, that is not my personal opinion. No, no, I, no. I'm just speaking on- I just on... raised it because right, I know right. it's out there. Right, right. So, <laughs> so my uh, response with that is a person making a mistake should project their future. There are people who are in prison for things that they have not committed. You know, people are in prison for years for uh, sentences they haven't done anything. You know, wrongful conviction is still high um, right now. So not saying that we are probably know everyone that's in prison who was wrongly convicted, but what about those people? You know, I just feel like there should be another level of saying just because you committed a crime you should be your uh, voice should be heard for the rest of your life if you're in jail mm -hmm. so I don't know how we can keep advocating advocating for that I don't know I mean that's kind of a hard pill for someone to swallow and say just because you made a mistake you no longer have your right you no longer have a voice so I don't know I think what I just come back to at all times is that we're talking about our democracy here and our democracy works better when more people are involved um, and we should be fighting for if we as the U.S. call ourselves the vanguard of democracy and really say our democracy is one of the best. Um, I think the PowerPoint slides that I will just go back to is that when we look at our rates of incarceration and our felony disenfranchisement laws. Mm -hmm. and the racial disparities of who's in our prisons, we need to ask ourselves a very hard question of um, what is this really doing and how is it impacting our communities of color? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think even as a fallback measure, it would, it would carry any water because then we'd have all the implementation stuff. I'm just, I'm just being, I'm just thinking out loud. You, you realize this is not my stand, but I'm just thinking um, if we hit a brick wall, is there any way around the wall for some of the people uh, who have lost the right to vote? That's, that's just where my brain was for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know, this has been great. Tina, what do you think? Uh, do we have more questions or should we wrap up? Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. 
No. Nope. Actually, I, I, do, I don't have a question. I have another comment. Um, <laughs> and this is not to um, be negative, it's just to be realistic regarding the history of the Illinois General Assembly. Um, historically, the Illinois General Assembly passes controversial bills into law if they're going to be passed in the year in which there's no election which would have been 2021. And so now that this has been deferred to spring of 2022, uh, something to think about um, is for those of you, including Alexandra, who's uh, working with Chicago Votes to Get Passage, is whether um, somebody who voted yes in veto session will still vote yes in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, I would recommend you don't make that assumption because it's X months before a primary election, even though most of them may not be contested in the primary, um, still um, the, the tendency historically is for the Illinois General Assembly to avoid controversial bills to be passed in the election year. And this, I think, is certainly controversial among some circles. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Definitely very controversial of a bill. Um, we've been told that many times of that you need to get this passed in 2021 because next year is an election. They're not going to want to vote on anything controversial. Um, I think having that in mind we're gonna still keep moving forward. We're gonna do the best we can do. We will not take any of these votes for granted. Definitely all of them need to be talked to again and recommitted. Um, definitely will not take any of these votes for granted. Um, but yeah, we have three months. We have a lot of community support. Um, and so legislators, they still gotta legislate for those couple of months, whether they're gonna do anything or not. We'll see, but I think we plan to be down in Springfield almost every week of legislative session. So we're in front of the faces of these lawmakers, happy to bring people down with us, anyone that's trying to be in Springfield as well, even though it's not really the most fun place to be. Um, <laughs> but, you know, getting in front of these faces um, just to see what can get done. We're talking with Representative Ford early next week. Um, just to see what is his plan um, for this. We haven't heard anything from him about this since the end of last veto session when he said he was gonna bring this up for a vote in January. So I would say if we can get this bill passed out of the house and done within the house in early January, um, I think that would show probably the best outcome for this. But again, I don't know. I'm just gonna keep fighting for what we believe in. <laughs> We're gonna see how far we get. And the more community support, the better. So if you could get to us um, um, dates when you'll be going down, uh, we can get, uh, we can either get those dates into our newsletter or we as the league could potentially choose to sign on for a date and maybe do something as uh, as the league so yeah. i will say we um we will have representation of chicago votes down in springfield every week of legislative session so those okay. three days every single week um and so there really any week league is welcome to come and join us even if it's just for a day and we can actually plan something um but also we're planning a little bit larger um, we're trying not to go too big, still just being mindful of the times that we're in, of uh, some of our more committed uh, coalition members in this to come down in February, um, really pending what is happening. And if we go down there and we can get, you know, garner momentum to get this pushed through. Um, I think if this passes the house, we're gonna be calling everybody and their mom and their grandma to come down and get this through the Senate. 
because if it passes the house i think i mean it's never passed the house so okay well keep us informed and um uh, tina you you'll be our point person for this absolutely yeah fantastic Great. Okay. Well, my email, I'll put it in the chat for everybody, is alex at chicagovotes.com. So I will just, you know, I'm very okay. accessible for questions and comments. So thank you, Alex. And, and you did such a nice little hug of the League of Women Voters, and I just want to return it. The League just adore Chicago votes. <laughs> you guys are great and we really, really have enjoyed working with you. Appreciate it so much, especially because next year we're doing this voting in prison, but we're also going to be working very hard on implementation of voting in jail. So <laughs> yep, <laughs> we're working together quite a lot. So I'm not <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, Alex, I don't know if you all know, but Alex did a, uh, <clears throat> What are we going to call it? A how-to session um, for local leagues to work with their uh, county clerks um, and their uh, sheriffs uh, to start getting uh, voting in jail uh, accomplished across the whole state. Did did I get all the right words in there? <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of different league chapters across the state that are trying to work with their sheriff's offices to get polling locations in their local jails. So we they're just trying to support them. Yeah, it was a great session. You, and Julie Sheldon from the uh, Chicago League was took part in it. Uh, she had a little piece um, and it was it was it was good. I thought the questions that came after that afterwards were all very targeted to getting a lot done. Yeah. Alex, thank you very much for sharing all of this info. Thank you very much for bringing me here. <laughs> Happy Saturday, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Tina. You're it welcome. was really interesting and informative. Thank you, everybody. Thank yes, you. Sir.